Welcome everyone to our block editor guest lecture. Um, this week, our trainees are learning about the role of block editor. And so I'm excited to interview our guest, uh, Ruben Cusada, on his work with the Kenyan Review. Um, and as you have read in his bio, Ruben is a poet, editor, and translator who has been published in many different literary magazines. Um, his series on the Kenyan Review's blog is called Poetry Today. It ran from 2019 to 2021, and it served as um, a platform for poets to share their creative process and their thoughts on poetry. So thank you, Ruben, for being here with us. And to start off, can you tell us about the work that you did um, with Poetry Today and how it started? Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm, I'm really grateful to Superstition Review, your staff, uh, your department, and, and to everyone behind the scenes that made this happen. Um, the, my time at the Kenyan Review was, um, was exciting. Uh, I started the series off with a bi-monthly post, and soon after, it uh, changed to a weekly post. And so, um, at that point, it became really important for me to uh, learn how to uh, work ahead and um, how to be very organized in order to ensure that I had a post every week. So I started there in 2019, but the series had its early kind of iterations um, at the Chicago Review of Books. Uh, and while it was there, it was called, um, it was called Dear Poetry Editor. And it ran from 2017 to 2019, but it wasn't until I moved to 2019 that I decided to change my focus exclusively to poets. And uh, in particular, poets who were publishing or had recently published a collection. And I was open really to poets who were publishing both a full length collection or a chapbook. Uh, my interest was to give poets a platform to be able to share the work that they were doing and also talk a little bit about the work that they were doing. When I was a grad student, when I was in college, I was really interested in the process of writing and what really went into or, or what was behind the scenes uh, when a poet was writing and revising their work. And I thought, what better way to learn about poetry and what poets around me were doing than to interview them. And uh, the, the, the big I think concern that I had when I first got started was how do I ensure that I have content uh, that is both interesting and um, that I had enough content. So when I started at, at Kenyan in, in 2019, uh, I already had um, poets in mind who I knew I wanted to talk to. Um, and when I had the idea of going to the Kenyan Review, I wanted to ensure that I presented myself in a manner that um, both looked like the project would be appealing to readers and also appeared, uh, it, the project itself appeared to be something that other poets were interested in. So I really needed to get buy-in from other poets. Uh, I had to have like a, um, a kind of a roster of poets who I knew would be willing to participate before I made the, before I made the proposal to the editors, editors at the Kenyan Review. Uh, while I was at, at Kenyan Review, I worked exclusively with their fiction editor, a woman named Kirsten Reach. And um, uh, you know, Kirsten was, was amazing. Um, she was the one who really encouraged me to increase the frequency of the posts. I, I'd never thought about uh, making it a weekly post, mostly because I was concerned that uh, I wouldn't have enough poets interested. So what I did was I, uh, I did a little bit of research. I found um, a number of poets who uh, had either just recently published a book or uh, or who, um, uh, who who were publishing a book in the next week or so. Um, because it was a weekly series, uh, I could plan ahead. Uh, so what I did was um, I, I created a, a, a file on Google Drive, an Excel spreadsheet. Um, and over time, I've, I've come to love spreadsheets, mostly because... Uh, it keeps me organized and I can share them with editors. So I created a spreadsheet where I, I kind of created like a wish list. Who do I want to talk to? Um, who are poets that have, have a book coming out? And I created the spreadsheet, just a list of names. And then I created a list of dates. I knew that I wanted to publish the series on a particular day of the week. Uh, I chose Tuesdays. 
um, mostly because after speaking with other poets and, and really examining when a lot of content was released online, um, it seemed to me that Tuesday was the day that people were most interested in reading content online and, and the activity was much higher, particularly on my personal website. So I used Google Analytics to really examine when would be a good time to publish work. And it turned out it was on a Tuesday. And I wanted to be sure that I uh, did it early enough, early enough in the day where people on the East Coast would um, have time to read it, but not too early where it would, it would arrive on the West Coast in the, in the middle of the morning or, or in the middle of the night. So uh, I would publish um, uh, every morning. Um, I, I'm in Central Time in Chicago, so I would publish uh, about 8 a.m. Uh, my time and... Um, I knew that uh, if I was able to schedule enough content that um, I, I wouldn't put myself into a position where if, um, if I didn't receive uh, the questions and answers back from a particular writer, that I wouldn't be in a jam, that I would still have content. So thinking, thinking ahead really helped. So, you know, the tools that I really needed were the spreadsheet, uh, I needed that wish list, and then I needed to know how to contact these writers. So over the years, um, really just from paying attention to what people are doing online or uh, just speaking to other writers and friends who they're reading, um, I got to meet other writers uh, and I got to interact with them online. So that really kind of opened a door for me to, to be able to contact writers and and. I, I've, I've always navigated the, the you know, literary spaces with the idea in mind that um, you know, we, we should treat people the way we want to be treated. And um, people in the community are, you know, there are people who are, who are, we're all kind of in it for the same reason. We really want to uh, ensure the longevity of literature. We want to be the ones writing the literature. You know, we want people reading us. And so I, 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 uh, I, I like to believe that um, people typically welcome attention to the work that they're doing, uh, whether you can compensate them or not. Uh, so uh, in many ways, you, you can say that it's free publicity. Uh, so um, with that in mind, I, I started contacting the people on my wish list. And uh, when I did that, I wanted to make sure that I was very clear about um, what I wanted from them uh, and um, you know, what was in it for them. So uh, I created a series of questions that I was very interested in about poetry. Um, you know, I, I, wanted to be, uh, I wanted to give poets a chance to reflect. And one of the questions that I, I asked right away was, what would you tell yourself um, as a young poet now looking back? And I used that as a, as a way to introduce each poet um, during each installment. And uh, I, I called that my introduction. So, um, and, and there were a number of other questions that focused on um, maybe the, the recent collection or um, if there was a poet that they were currently reading or were inspired by, I also wanted to know that. And um, I, I, uh, I asked a question that was related to poets who were no longer around. Um, mostly because I'm also interested in the history of poetry. And I want to know about what poets people are reading that are no longer with us, poets from the past. I think the past uh, is just as important as the present. And um, you know, we wouldn't be where we are without the poets who came before us. And I wanted to know what other poets uh, had read before. So uh, I came up with this kind of a standard questionnaire. And I, I figured that that would be the most efficient way to, um, to solicit answers from other poets without it becoming too overwhelming for me. Uh, and I say that mostly because I, I, uh, I sometimes tend to, um, I'm really curious. And so I tend to take on a lot of projects because I'm, I'm really excited about the work that other people are doing. So in order to juggle not only my own writing, but uh, um, explore my interests in the literary arts, I knew I had to find a way to 
make the process streamlined and um, and and not feel too overwhelmed by um, by by this whole process. So um, I came up with a standard questionnaire, and after a while, that questionnaire became uh, I kind of polished it over time, and um, and and so I had a series of four to five questions that I asked everyone, and it became really interesting to to examine the responses from from poets from around the world, and uh, and just learn how 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 distinctive each poet's experience had been. Uh, and, um, and, and only a few times during the process, during the two years at Kenyon, did I change the questions. And, and the only reason that would happen was there sometimes um, were questions about um, the responses that poets wanted to offer. So, uh, poets wanted to explore certain areas. And I, I tried to create open-ended questions or, or open-ended enough where they could explore any ideas that they wanted to explore, especially because the whole point was for them to uh, share about their recent publication and to really speak about themselves, right? So the series wasn't necessarily about me. And another way that I ensured that that would happen was um, typically, when you see a, a, an interview published online, you'll see um, either a full name or the initials of the people exchanging, making the exchange. And in this series, if you go back, um, uh, I, I am not present in any of those responses. Um, I might have the byline uh, on, the, on the blog page, but um, I, I, I tried to really avoid inserting myself into the responses that I received. And I made sure I was clear about that from the beginning with the poets that I, I solicited um, because I wanted to, I wanted their responses to appear as if they were simply um, reflecting upon a particular idea or a particular question. And so uh, sometimes I would have to um, edit the answers so that their responses appeared as if they were responding simply to uh, that the heading for their answers. So if you go back, you'll see there, there are different headers to each of their responses. And so there was some editing that had to happen on occasion, but for the most part, um, uh, people were, were pretty understanding. So- um, I'm not sure I understand. Oh boy, that was my watch. <laughs> um, so, so the series really kind of, flourished over time and over time people started reading the the series and it allowed me to have more access to other writers um uh, i think because of the uh because of the fact that it was online um, i had um, many more readers and I, I i really wanted as many people to be able to read uh, and have access to this series and so it it seemed natural um, to put it on a on a website on a blog that was fully accessible or or free to readers, and um, and so over time I, I really just became really organized about um, the the questions that I wanted to ask readers. Uh, the Excel spreadsheet really helped me to to plan and plan ahead. I typically tried to plan about three to four weeks ahead so that I had enough time to. Um, move people around if, if people needed more time to answer the questions. Uh, now, one of the really important things I think is uh, giving poets enough time to answer the questions. Uh, it's been my experience when um, answering interview questions that, you know, there, there are some people who will give you months and there's some people who will give you uh, just a couple of weeks. And um, I always found it really challenging to balance the, the projects that I was doing and also give people the time uh, to answer their questions. And so the more time I had, the, the better my, my answers were because I had more time to, to reflect and really think about what I wanted to express. And so um, I tried to give writers anywhere between six to eight weeks to respond. And I, I didn't have an expectation about word count. Uh, I simply said, uh, um, I, I'm, I'm just interested in uh, your own answer to these questions. There's no specified length. And you know, some people responded with a few sentences to, to a question. Some people responded with 
many, many paragraphs. And so I think that also gave the, the piece a really, its own really kind of special look because there was, there, there were so many different ways that someone could answer. Um, and so I, after, you know, once I had content down, I had my wish list down, uh, I was able to organize my spreadsheet. Uh, I then just shared that spreadsheet with my editor so that they knew what was coming and they knew um, uh, who was coming, uh, who was going to be on the series. And, um, and uh, yeah, that I, was, I, I feel really fortunate to have had it over, over the period of two years. I, I really didn't expect it to go that long. Uh, mostly because it's, um, you know, ensuring that you have content every week for, uh, you know, almost two years is, um, that can take a lot of time. But, you know, to, in that second year, uh, I, I think, I, think I, I had it down where um, I, I knew who I wanted to ask and I knew how much time I needed. And so um, just ensuring that everything was scheduled and I followed my schedule, I think really helped make it successful. Yeah, that's great. Um, I, you definitely worked with a lot of poets because each post uh, featured two poets and it was a weekly thing. Um, so it was definitely a lot. And I think your personal experience being a poet yourself also helped you, um, you know, create an, uh, the right space for the poets to share their creative process. Um, but you've also worked as a poetry editor. So I'm wondering if you could tell us um, you know, the differences you felt working editing poetry versus with the blog and the different skills you use with each? That's a great question. Um, <clears throat> uh, I've had two really interesting recent experiences. So I just finished editing a uh, folio for um, a magazine out of the University of Central Missouri called Pleiades. And so, um, the, the Pleiades folio is focused on Latinx LGBTQ plus IA writers. And uh, that was a proposal that I made um, to a couple of ed editors. And uh, again, I was, I was interested in learning from and, and reading a particular type of writer. And, um, and so this folio was, was that type of writer that I really wanted to feature and draw more attention to. Uh, and that, will be a print issue. It'll be out um, later this spring. Uh, what was different about that versus the, the, the blog is um, this, this is gonna be a print issue and I wanted to open the opportunity up to as many writers as I could, mostly because, um, because it was such a niche uh, community. Uh, I was concerned that I, um, may not know enough people, enough poets who fit into that, into that um, community. And, um, you know, it's, it's difficult to tell sometimes uh, who, who might fit into what community and what intersections uh, they bring. So uh, I created a, a Google form uh, to uh, open it up to a, a general um, uh, submitter. And I, I had the magazine help me promote uh, that submission process. And so um, I, I was much more hands-on with that issue. Uh, and, and what I mean is that um, uh, I, I had a, a limited amount of space. So Pleiades gave me something like um, 40 to 50 pages that I could use uh, from the print journal. And uh, so I had to be really mindful of how much space I had, how many pages, uh, a poem would occupy, and um, and so that meant that sometimes I, I I found a poem that I really loved, but um, it was it was perhaps too long, and um, and I knew that um, uh, out of my own personal experience of of writing, I knew that there was a way to make this poem uh, fit into the space that I was given, and so. Um, it was at that point that I created a Google Doc. Uh, I love, I love, you know, this, this kind of form of technology that can be shared with others. And so Google Docs really helped me provide editorial suggestions to the writers and kind of work back and forth when we had to, to get to a place where I could accept the poem finally uh, for inclusion. Now, um, the summer before, um, I served as a, a guest poetry editor for Pink. So Pink Magazine 
um, that particular folio was all online. And, you know, I, I wanted a purpose. I wanted a reason to do it. And so the reason uh, for, you know, making this proposal to different journals, which Pank eventually uh, took on, was I wanted to feature Latinx poets. And, um, you know, and at the time, I, I, everyone has their own, I think, sensibility about um, what that means. Uh, for me, um, it's, it's anyone who has connections or ties to Latin America. Um, and so that, that can include people who um, speak Spanish uh, or, or are heritage Spanish speakers or, or even speak uh, Portuguese or, um, you know, and there, there are some people uh, like those from Guyana where English is actually the official language um, who, who don't really fall into these language-based categories. So Latin America seemed to be the best way to be as inclusive as possible. And uh, in a similar fashion uh, with the Pleiades project, I, um, I opened up the opportunity and, and uh, allowed people to submit to this project. And I also reached out to some people because I knew that there were people that I wanted to connect with and that I wanted to include. Uh, as, as a Latinx person, um, I knew many Latinx poets. And so um, that, uh, that background really helped me to produce this folio. Um, and again, what I did with this is uh, uh, Pank gave me certain days where they would allow me to publish. So they said, you can publish any, every Tuesday and Thursday. Those are yours. Um, how many poets you want to publish on those days is up to you. And I knew that I wanted to publish as many poets as possible. And so I created a spreadsheet that included those two days. And I split each of those days into day parts because I wanted to be able to pub publish multiple poets on each of those days. So I ended up publishing five poets on each day uh, or five writers because I also, I also accepted prose for this, uh, this particular folio. And uh, once I knew I had, I had these kind of time slots to fill, then I, then I could go and start accepting work and really just plugging it into my spreadsheet. And then I would go back and ensure that I wanted the pieces the way I wanted them to appear online. Um, and for this particular folio, I had, to, I had to upload all the content myself. And, um, and so I knew I had to create, ensure that I had time to do that. Um, so, you know, some, some two very different approaches. Um, uh, you know, one magazine just said, here's the space, do what you want with it. And the other said, uh, you have these two days to work with and, um, and, and you have to complete the project within this, this particular time frame. And so for Pank, it was, a, it was about six weeks um, and I was able to publish um, just over a hundred writers um, in, during that period. So that was really exciting. Yeah, um, and I think uh, the trainees that are hearing about the differences of each role will really, um, that will really help them understand more about um, the skill that is needed in blogging specifically. Um, I'd like to open up real quick to the audience. If you guys have any questions, you can unmute and ask, or you can type it in the chat, um, and I can read it out loud as well. Anyone have a question? Oh, okay. Perry says, uh, what moves did you make to increase traffic to the blog? That's a, that's a great question. So, um, you know, there, there's been a recent, uh, at least I've observed a recent uh, uptick in people on social media in particular, uh, which is really a good resource for, for any kind of online publication. Um, people have been really interested in celebrating others. Uh, I, I've, over time, you know, I've, I've come to believe that there is a reader for every writer, and it's just a matter of that reader finding you. Um, and that really not only, I think, I think that's, I think that's very real. I think that there are enough people in the world to have their own particular interests that there, there, there very well might be a reader for every writer. Um, and so, uh, how do, uh, you know, the question that I asked myself was, how do I get as many eyes on this project as possible? And sometimes that meant um, asking friends 
if they would share something or, um, uh, you know, one model that I learned early on um, when I was um, when I was in college and really doing a lot of research about the online presence of literary magazines. This was this was about a, a decade or so ago. Is that um, social media is like is like um, like being on a highway. People will stop if there's an accident, right? They want to they want to see that crash. They they're just morbid curiosity or just curiosity about what what's what's all the attention about. And so uh, I had to find a way to uh, make a splash or to create interest uh, either uh, leading up to the publication or once the publication was out. And so. Uh, for me, that meant that I would include as many people as possible, because if you have more people uh, who are part of the project, then they'll want other, they'll want people they know to come and read the, read the work. And so that really helped to increase traffic. Um, I tried to find ways to um, uh, put myself in a position where I could talk about these kind of projects, similar to this, this opportunity that I'm in right now. Uh, so if you can find a way to um, draw attention to yourself by something related to the literary arts, then it gives you an opportunity to talk about the work that you're doing. And, um, and then just really following up with the poets and the writers that you're going to publish and that you have published and giving them an opportunity and letting them know, hey, you were part of this project. Uh, it's still ongoing. This is, this is what's happening. And if you have anyone that you think would be interested in participating, you know, let them know about it. I'd love to hear about it. And often I would get emails from people I'd publish saying, oh, this person has something out, you should consider contacting them. So then my, my network grew and my readership grew in that way. Um, okay, and then we have a last question from Taylor Montano. You mentioned that even if you cannot provide monetary compensation for interviews, you market it as free publicity. Um, do you tend to get more traction one way or the other? Um, I think that's a great question because I, I think that, um, I think artists need to be compensated. I think that sometimes it can be difficult to do depending on who's doing it. And so, um, you know, I'll give you an example. Uh, so the series that I currently run, the, the reading series, the Mercy Street Readings, um, I, I created a, uh, so I use an online ticketing service that allows people to access the event for free, but um, also provides them an opportunity to make donations. And, and so those donations really support um, payment for the, the writer or the, or the artist. And, um, and it also covers all the other administrative expenses like a, a sign language interpreter and, and at the time closed captioning before Zoom integrated it into their kind of basic package. But, um, uh, you know, it really depends on the poet and how much the poet really uh, believes in the project that they're involved in. There, there were poets who, um, were very active online and shared the work and celebrated the work. And, um, and then there were poets who um, weren't as involved. And, you know, for, for whatever reason, um, you know, someone might choose to get more involved, uh, you know, for, for one project over another. But um, I wouldn't say that the compensation really made much of a difference. I, I don't think it made much of a difference, though. Um, you know, I, I always try to create opportunity for that. And because it wasn't my magazine, Kenyan Review wasn't something that I had control over necessarily. You know, I was just a contributor. Um, I made that very clear during my ask, during my solicitation is, you know, this is something I'm doing for the Kenyan Review. These are poets who are already involved. I wish, I, you know, I, I, if I could offer compensation, I could, but, um, at the moment, I, I can't, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm willing to share the work and, and really I just wanna create an opportunity for you to be able to um, get more attention to the work that you're doing. So always, you know, I think always refocusing the uh, approach or the ask to center uh, the person that you're asking so that they know that this work, this is, this is not only good for them, um, but uh, you know, it's good, it's good for sales and it's good for, uh, you know, it's good for everybody. I think you just have to have that buy-in. 
Well, that's all the time we have for today. Um, thank you so much, interns and trainees, for coming and um, asking your questions. Thank you, Ruben, for your time.